going to call to order the uh, Sioux Falls City Council Fiscal Committee meeting. This is November 1st, 2016. We're all kind of haphazard here. I appreciate those of you that are here with us at Carnegie Town Hall and those of you watching us online or on uh, CityLink channel, no, 16 and others. <laughs> um, again, Fiscal Committee, and we're going to uh, start a conversation today about um, the city's role in budgeting for uh, prevention, con um, drug abuse prevention in the school district. So um, big conversation starting with just small bites today, but I'm going to start then um, with approval of the minutes. Our last meeting actually because of budgets and other things was July 12th. I need a motion to approve, if I might. I would move to approve the minutes as presented. Thank you. Second, and all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move right into our reports and updates. I'm going to ask um, our budget analyst, Dave Bixler, to just give us that sort of nutshell reminder of where we are with, with this project and why it is that the council wanted this committee to take this on. So thanks. Dave Bixler, budget analyst for the city council. Uh, what we have here is uh, there's been funding for the Prairie View Prevention Centers for some years. Uh, it's been going on since 2011 when I first came on board and, and prior to that. Uh, during this last budget uh, cycle, it was uh, determined or it was planned to phase out the, the funding, um, 103500 in 2017 and then the balance in 2018. Um, the council did amend the budget to reinstate the funding back to its full amount of 207000 And uh, as we were going through that, a number of counselors had questions and there are some gaps and a uh, few things that uh, a few questions that need to be answered and so that's really where we're at today great thank you i'm going to start with prairie view prevention mrs jensen darcy jensen would you like to come forward and just talk us through again maybe sort of that reader's digest version of who you are and what you do for the community and then we'll kind of go from there I'm Darcy Jensen. I'm the Executive Director for Prairie View Prevention Services. It's a prevention intervention service that's been in Sioux Falls for almost 20 years. We started working with the city and the Sioux Falls School District almost 16 years ago, actually, when we came together and looked at how could we provide services together instead of separately in doing that. We have been working in the Sioux Falls schools and the Catholic schools since that first initial contract. I believe Mayor Hansen was mayor at that point. And then on through Mayor Munson and through our current mayor, we have continued to provide those drug and alcohol services within the school setting. Great, good, all right. Um, then we also have a representative from the school district. I'm gonna have you come forward if you might, Mr. Noll. James Nold, um, would you just give us from the school district perspective, how do you use Prairie View Prevention and how, what kind of relationship do you have with them in terms of funding and that kind of thing? My name is James Nold, the Assistant Superintendent with the Sioux Falls School District. And right now our, our relationship with Prairie View Prevention, obviously working with uh, youth and, and in the area of chemical dependency, uh, whether that be situations that happen in the community or at the school, uh, but providing services for those individual students that, that do attend in the Sioux Falls uh, school system to be able to get that help and assistance needed. And if they can get that help and assistance needed with chemical dependency, um, our goal as a school district is, is that they can be able to go through and get their education and not have that impeded. So we have utilized uh, the resources of Prairie View Prevention to garner that chemical dependency counseling for our students. Um, that may need that, whether those situations have happened in school or out of school, but it's to provide those services that we can refer them to to be able to get services and help uh, so it does not impact their education or minimizes the impact on their education. And to clarify, your um, the Prairie View Prevention comes into the schools and um, provides counseling and uh, in information to classrooms and then deals with individual students directly then you have a contract with Prairie View Prevention that's funded through city funds, is that correct? We do have a, a contract with Prairie View Prevention to provide those counseling services in the area of chemical dependency with our students. Uh, some of that will be within our, our building sites 
and some of that will be where they go to groups or, or meetings outside of our building sites. Uh, most of that uh, counseling piece um, where they go to the groups and sessions will be outside of the school time and they'll receive those services outside of that school time. But there is an individual that does come into our building that may meet and do an assessment or at least make that contact with the students in our schools uh, in the middle schools and high schools would be the predominance of that. Okay, great. I'm gonna open this up to just sort of open discussion with the committee um, because we're just really kind of in those first conversations, kind of fact finding. And so I guess I know that the podium really is, really only has space for one person, but if we can kind of just wiggle back and forth as we ask questions, Darcy, if you wanna just come forward as well so that you're available. And I'm just gonna open it up to the committee to start with questions. Councilor Erickson, are you, you have been as involved in this as anyone. So I'm just gonna kind of toss it to you yes. and let you start. Thank you. Well, I do have um, just some general overview questions, I guess. My, my question is uh, maybe not even um, for you, Mr. Nold, but for Darcy, as far as we have um, agreements with um, the, the Christian high schools as well in town. So I'm curious if we have separate agreements with them or is it all funneled one way? How does, how does that work? We currently have an agreement with the Catholic schools. That is the only school that we have a, a contract or an agreement with where we have a counselor actually in their building okay. as we do in the Sioux Falls schools. We, however, do provide services for any student who would need that from the Sioux Falls city as a whole they would be coming to our office for that screening or assessment to be done. And then the groups that we provide are funded through our Office of Highway Safety, and that funding is available for any student who's in Lincoln or Minnehaha County. So the group then would be at no cost to any Lincoln or Minnehaha County student and their family. And that designation comes from the state. As an agency, we've applied and been awarded and designated that Okay, so then if I can keep going on that same realm, you said a key thing that was my next question as far as um, obviously Jamie Nold is with the Sioux Falls School District and we have how many different school uh, school districts within the city limits of Sioux Falls? Six, seven, something, seven? So my question is, is our, our contract is only through Sioux Falls School District and the Catholic schools. Are we missing a big chunk of students of, of youth that may live just past T. Ellis and attend T, or may live um, out in Arbor's Edge and go to Brandon. Are they able to get services as well, or is it strictly? They, they have opportunity for services, and we currently are serving students from some of those districts in our prevention groups right now. Because our service area includes all of Lincoln and Minnehaha County, they are included and can have the opportunity to seek services for having that screening and attending any of our groups. So do you have counselors in those schools? Then? We do not have counselors in those schools. They call you and But they can, can call assessment. and come in, set up an appointment for after school, or we've had some parents who have decided to take their child out of school for morning or study hall or over lunch and actually bring them to the office. So then also, if I may, mm -hmm. yes, Madam please. Chair, I'm sorry, I just mm -hmm. kind of keep going here. So obviously there's several different silos of money that you can't use the money that is done with the Sioux Falls School District for that. And so that would come out of the state funding versus coming out of the city of Sioux Falls. Is that right? So really any kid within any youth that would need these services would have the ability to receive that based on the different buckets of money. Is that a fair? That, that would be a fair assessment. And in years, many years ago, when this partnership came together, at that time there, one is, there was not as many school districts within the city limits, but I do know that Sioux Falls Christian was approached, uh, Mayor Hansen approached, and I believe it would have been maybe Dr. Keegan at that point and asking them if they would like to be involved. And at that point they declined. I, you know, since then that might have changed. They may feel differently, but that was in the original first years of the agreement, they were part of being asked to participate. Right. And I have a few other questions, but a statement I definitely want to make is, um, you know, 
for myself personally, I am so appreciative that we are allowed to have that relationship with the Sioux Falls School District, to have a counselor there, to have easy access to those students instead of saying, when you get out of school, you need to come over to the office and have this assessment and they're going to go, yeah, right, I'm going to hang out with my friends or whatever the excuse may be. And so to have somebody in those schools, to have those prevention um, services, I think is absolute key to trying to get the youth back on track, get them um, going down the right path and making better choices and getting a better education so they graduate, possibly go to college or get a, a good job and are out on their own. So I'm appreciative for the relationship that has been formed. Oftentimes we beg for that and this is a great example of that relationship already happening. Um, I know for us as a council we did vote for this additional funding but it was such a big issue and we kind of had to get our hands back around this and that's the reason why we're here again today is how can we make this better instead of just kind of swooping a check through is it is it through the police department I see Chief Burns here maybe he'd like to say a few statements so is it best through the police department is it best through health I, I don't know and we just want to certainly make sure that the dollars spent are are being used in the, and I'm not, I'm not insinuating that they're not, but just understanding it from the council's perspective because we hear so much about prevention and Mary Michaels was here and gave a great overview of what they've gathered for information about prevention and prevention, prevention, prevention is, is just absolutely key for so many different areas and so um, it's definitely a priority to us in understanding kind of the relationships and how this works. I'm, as I digress off of that, I'm curious if Darcy, um, or Jamie or Chief Burns, if you would mind just talking a little bit about the accountability with the reporting as far as how the information is shared amongst the agency about, I know we're dealing with minors and so it's very specific as not sharing sensitive information, but I'm wondering if you could just kind of walk through that a little bit for us as far as the reporting through the police department and through the school districts. Certainly, um, when we're reporting our information, on a yearly basis, the state, Chief Burns, and the school district get a annual report indicating how many individual sessions we've done, how many assessments we've done, how many students who have already had an assessment but need an update, meaning there's been another incident, violation, citation. We also tell them the number of screenings we've done, number of students who have participated in any of our prevention activities, Right now we're in the midst of our Red Ribbon, or we just finished Red Ribbon Week, and that was a week-long prevention effort in our schools. So the number of kids who participated in those activities. We'll have our 4D, which is our drinking, drugged, and distracted driving in December. So all of those numbers, how many classrooms we've been in, those are all things that we need to report. In addition, because of our state funding, we also need to monitor and be able to show measurable outcomes. What are the things we have achieved? Are we seeing that there's a greater um, respect for or that the perception of harm has increased? We know if someone perceives something as harmful, they're less likely to be involved. So part of our reporting to the state and then which goes federally after that is to look at the perception of harm, risk of injury, and age of first use and past 30 day use. So those are a key factor as part of our outcomes that we must collect for our state funding. And those are reported on a quarterly basis for looking at the 30 day use, but then we do an annual report for the state, which then is reported federally on our, all of those factors or indicators. So the reporting is not done by, you know, Darcy Jensen had a violation Instead, it's done by number or percent of kids that would have had citations are involved. I believe in the packet I shared before, we also track law enforcement and get that information. So how many juveniles were arrested? Are we seeing a reduction in arrests or citations as part of that outcome? So our reporting doesn't include a way for us to individ or for any of the people who are receiving the report to know individually. As an agency, we, we track individually recidivism and we track if there's been a need for a higher level of care, but that's not something that, that we report out to anyone based on not wanting to violate any HIPAA. Right, right, makes sense. 
How does that make sense? Other questions from council members? Councilor Starr? Yes, thank you. Assistant Superintendent Nold, thank you for being here. I want to echo the same thing. It's great that we can work together as a city and uh, school yeah. district. But stepping aside from this program, I know in your, your past life you've spent a lot of time in the hallways at Washington and, and you see what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Help us understand, is this the right way not necessarily that this is the right way. What would you see as the ideal program? What are we missing? Are we doing everything that we can? Because our big concern through our budget hearings was basically we want to make sure that we're doing prevention. We've talked a lot about meth in the last couple of weeks from a city point of view, but the, the use of drugs and alcohol and what is that typical student or group of students in a high school in Sioux Falls, Brandon, the Catholic schools, the Sioux Falls Christians, what can we do from a preventative basis to best use the money that we're trying to invest here? I know it seems to me that over the years the programs change from a federal um, process, what the state's looking for. The bottom line, you see what you need on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis and that's kind of where I am interested in your... Yeah. Good knowledge. There is no question in part of, uh, and so I may wander a little bit here, but um, there's no question there's a, a service needed for the kids that are part of the city of Sioux Falls, the Sioux Falls School District, uh, our community as a whole, and, and they're all part of that whole mix. Um, the growth that we have seen significantly in it is the use of marijuana. Uh, marijuana has, has grown over the last several years, and we see that that impacts the kids academically. Uh, we know it impacts them socially as well, but it's definitely impacting their academics, their attendance, uh, and things like that. So the service, in our view, needs to be there and, and provided for the students to be able to help them because it's impacting their education, which will, will, will hurt them long term uh, as being a productive citizen, especially for our community here. So we have seen, uh, substance abuse, substance use. So there's no question there's programming that is, is needed. Um, on behalf of the school district, uh, it's a service that obviously we need. We don't have a vested interest per se monetarily in Prairie View Prevention. We have a vested interest in the kids that come into our school every single day. And they definitely have been impacted by chemical dependency. Um, so I think we see that in different areas throughout the city, but there's no question we're seeing that in the schools and the predominance of that. And it's a gateway drug, obviously, with the use of marijuana and other things that may be more significant, as in the meth use. Um, but we need the services to help those kids uh, so that they can be more productive in the classroom, in the schools, and be active in the schools and be attending every day. No, but thank you. I think one of the things that stands out to me through this whole process, it would be similar to a student coming with a, a hearing disability, yeah. possibly. Different groups in town have provided the school district, if I'm not mistaken, with uh, audiometers and being able to at least do the screening, because if you can't hear in the classroom, you need to be taught in a different yeah. way. I kind of see what we're doing here as a city of providing those resources yeah. to, to the district to do um, to do the prevention, to do the type of things that, that maybe we can step in before the problem escalates and type of things. But I'm wondering, are we doing it in, the, in a way that is helpful to the school or the way that you see the program going? Or do we need to adapt what the program does? Obviously, I'm sure you would say we need more funds. That's always yeah. an, an easy way to go. And it's the first thing that it, came to mind. <laughs> exactly. How far do we go with something like this? And, um, but our, you know, originally we're trying to make sure that we get the best use of our funds and our dollars that we're investing because for me this is a, a workforce development issue I think uh, Councillor Erickson made that point as well that once you have that criminal record it's difficult to go on to school it's difficult to find employment um, we have opportunities for jobs in Sioux Falls but we've got to make sure that our students get the education that they need so again other than other than the magic wand of um, more funding are, are we doing this in the right way, I guess, is where I'm headed. And, and the hard part in that is going to be, you know, even in my five years as assistant principal, ten years as a, a principal, I've not known a different way that way. I, I know that we continually refer students to, to those services or, or individuals, if it's happened in the community, to refer them to those services to get that help. 
And so to be able to say that we need to tweak or change this part of the, the system, I guess I don't know on that piece, but I'd have to look at that much further and I could get feedback from our building principals of, of what areas do we see a greater need in. Um, I do know as a building principal when I knew an individual had concerns and issues with chemical dependency, um, you know, much like the dental van comes around and, and does the dental work, uh, they're not going to be able to study very well that night if they're worried about their tooth hurting or, or things like that. And so as a service the community provided to help that kid, we provided them access to that kid to get the kid help because we knew it would help them educationally. And the chemical dependency piece, if they're struggling with that portion of it, they're not going to get their education until that's taken care of. And usually when I've talked to the parents, uh, whether they go through to Prairie View Prevention, if they decide to go to some other location, as far as the school district, our greatest concern is that they go and get help. Um, it has so happened that Prairie View has been the provider of that, so we've been very appreciative of, of the relationship that way because then we know who to refer them to. Does there need to be changes to the program? I don't know that off the top of my head because I've realized, you know, one formally set program that we were referred to um, and we've referred to other agencies depending on what the, the parents are asking for. But we would really, I'd have to get feedback from building principals or others within the system that way to look at it. It was probably more specifically our, our counselors um, and our success coordinators that we had put into place to help with these students to get them referred or the help that they need. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Rolfing. Yes. Thank you. Um, Darcy, first question. Um, what, are other, what other districts do you work with besides, excuse me. <coughs> Bless that you. came up, um, the Sioux Falls School District and, uh, and the Sioux Falls Catholic System. We also work with the Canton School District and have a counselor there. Okay. In the past, we had had one at Harrisburg, but they chose to spend their funding because they were putting in a portion because they didn't have a city budget to be helpful to them. And we could only offer a portion with our state funding because the state funding requires more than one entity being a partner. And so they withdrew. We still see all of those Harrisburg kids. We just don't see them in their building at this point. Okay. Um, what do you, what, what's the charge for the kids when they're referred to you? If they're referred to us and it's a Sioux Falls, if it's Minnehaha or Lincoln County, then there isn't a charge. Okay. The only way there would be a charge we put a $50 charge on a group. If a, a student has been screened and they've been offered the group three times, meaning we've sent the letter out, said here's when the group is, it's at no cost to you, please come, and they don't come, then we need to report back to the school district and to maybe teen court, whoever else needs to be told. Then we will send it out the next time we run the group, which is usually that next month, and if we get no response, then we'll do a third time. But at that time, we have spent staff time, clerical time, mailing time to work with that family. So then at that point, we say, we're charging $50 for you to attend the group. But that would be the only time. And we've still waived that often because there hasn't been funding for that. For, you know, if a family has no funding, then we've still waived it. Okay. Um Jamie, what would you do if, if uh, Prairie View is not available? Uh, we would be looking for some other type of a service provider within this area uh, to be able to try to work that out. It is not that we would have the funds, at least currently the funds in there, so we'd be trying to look to see who else would be able to provide those services for the students. For at no cost to you? That would be our obvious desire on that because we do not have that fund in. We do. Um, and have contributed into things with our social workers, addition of our social workers, our success coordinators that work with anybody that's coming back off of, uh, you know, truancy or um, if they've been lodged in, in juvenile detention or at a state facility. So we have hired individuals to uh, work on that end of it within our school buildings to help that acclimation and transition. But as far as the chemical dependency piece, we have relied on the services that have been provided, which has been through Prairie View Prevention. And the city, and the city. Yeah. Yes. How much? Um, how much uh, do you get from state funding, Darcy? I need to probably look to make sure I, I know or, or ask Kevin specifically for the dollar amount. It changes each year based on the the state contract. 
We also get from two se separate entities. We get from highway safety, which is what pays for the groups, those prevention groups we've been talking about. And that contract comes out and is awarded to an agency, an accredited state agency, so that no one else, for example, like Keystone, VOA, Bartles, any of those other agencies don't have access to those funds once the state awards it to a, an agency. So that's why it's free for our students in Lincoln and Minnehaha County to attend is because of the, the funding provided. Do you have the state dollar amount? About 100. I'll just real quickly. Uh, Kevin Jensen, Prairie View Prevention Services. We get about of our total state contract, about 130,000 that's usable for the schools. So when we combine that um, with the city money, we have about 337,000 that, uh, that, you know, when you start paying six and seven staff, it doesn't go very far. Yep, <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, yeah the, highway, the highway safety part, uh, like Darcy said, that just pays for the groups, I think this year is 21,000, but I included that in 130. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, can I keep going? Yes, please go right ahead. I'm on a roll. Yes. Um, Jamie, just a blunt question. Yeah. Why, why won't the school system put the money in or at least split it with us on, mm -hmm. on this type of, yeah. uh, this type of, because I see the benefit for the city, yeah. but I also see, as you said, you mentioned, um, you have a vested interest in the kids getting into school, educating them. That's your job. And it would seem to me that this is this would allow uh, more kids to be part of your program, your educational program, and have good outcomes. And I'm, I'm just flabbergasted at why you say we can't we can't do it. And there's a lot of areas that we absolutely do, and uh, but the area of chemical dependency is a, a place that we know the students need help on. So our role in the school system has been able to refer them to places to be able to get that help that they do. We have not opened up those uh, things and, and paid for through the Sioux Falls School District, but we definitely get students in contact and families in contact when they come to us say they need help because school is a place that most individuals will come in and talk to somebody like a school counselor or things like that. So we help to refer them to services that they can go and get help at. There's a lot of other services that our counselors help refer families to that we don't fund it within the school district. Uh, areas that they can go to sleep at night, areas that they can go get food, uh, areas that they can get counseling, areas that they can get chemical dependency counseling. But there's a lot of areas that the Sioux Falls School District does help families find services for in our community. And this is one of those areas, chemical dependency, because we know if a kid doesn't have a place to sleep at night, their ability to do well the next day is probably not very good. We know if a kid has a chemical dependency issue, uh, their ability to do well in school that next day is not gonna be very good. It is not that the chemical dependency is happening at the school, but they're being impacted at the school. So we try to direct them to the services uh, that are within our community to be able to get that help. And we would continue to direct them towards the services. If the money was not funded to Prairie View Prevention, we're gonna find some other place within our community then to make sure that we can direct kids to get help. Hopefully it would not be a charge to those individual students, much like a place to eat and a place to sleep and a place to be able to be. Uh, medical assistance is another area that we would try to refer uh, families to to be able to get some help if they cannot afford it. Mm -hmm. And so much like all those services, they are not things that we put into a budget of a Sioux Falls school district, but it's areas that we know we gotta get the kid help and connected with, and this is one of those. Is having them in the schools or on call, so to speak, as I understand it, is that um, an important part of Prairie View's uh, uh, mission, if you will? I couldn't answer that for Prairie View's mission. I can say that it does help because of the fact, with a student, because of the fact then they have a place that they go and talk to the kid and be able to get that done and the parents feel very comfortable coming to the school where we say, you know what, if you need help, go to this location, they may not go there. Uh, much the same as a, a Department of Social Services worker would come, they will come a lot of times to the school because they know there's a safe place there that a family will come to, uh, then they may do those meetings and, and often do those meetings outside of the school. But they make that a contact point, um, so we would continue to try to find those services within our community for that. May I ask one yes, more question? absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, 
Darcy recidivism. Um, it seems to me that that would be one of the one of the key um, uh, measurements that you you said you had to send to the uh, to the state on a quarterly and an annual basis. Um, do you know what the recidivism is um, as to uh, a kid gets picked up for uh, DWI, DUI, whatever it is, and um, he's referred to he or she is referred to you, and um, and then six months later is back doing this, is back on the same thing. Uh, is that is that something that you measure? That's a difficult question to answer, and I'll explain why. The changes that have happened with the juvenile justice system and <clears throat> students getting a, a ticket versus truly arrested and, and moving through the system like we may have seen it before allows students more opportunity, I guess, to be involved in activities before we would know that they were involved again in an activity because they're not they may have gotten the ticket, but they're not being asked to have a consequence as seeing a drug and alcohol counselor or going through the program. Because of that, I couldn't say with certainty that based on a thousand tickets that we saw 20 return because they got that next ticket. It may take us more than six months before we would know. So because of the kids having that 120 days from the time that they got the citation and then it goes through the state's attorney's office and then goes to teen court or, or they're referred to CAB, the Community Accountability Board, and put on the roster for one of the CAB meetings, we could have over six months pass before. So for us to say, look at a six month recidivism would not be easy in knowing that we got all the kids because they they don't necessarily come back through the system as quickly to give us that. Does that answer what, your question? No. I didn't think so. I, no, I'm, I still don't understand why if they get picked up the second time, you are not notified, the school is not notified that um, that this person has been picked up. How do you find out about the first yeah, can time? Can you take the time parameter off of the question? Yeah. You're, question had a six month time parameter on it. Take the time parameter on it yeah. off of it and talk about recidivism in general. In general, if a student has seen us once and they come back, when we look at, I believe it was last year, and I, I had the numbers when we met in July and I don't have them in my head, but we had a very low recidivism rate in the number of kids who come back into Prairie View. And I, I can get you that number, I just don't have it with me right now to, to give you that. What we're seeing is some kids come to us now who are not prevention students, and so we make a referral to a treatment provider because we provide prevention and early intervention services. We don't provide treatment. If they're going to a treatment center, then that would be a referral back. We may see them again to do an update or they may go back to that provider. So if they went to Keystone originally, we would do the first assessment, refer them to Keystone because they had a diagnosis. If they had a second violation, we wouldn't necessarily know that because the, the family would go straight back to Keystone if it was for treatment or relapse. At that point, because we do prevention intervention, we wouldn't, they may come to us and say, I need to have an update, and we would do an update for the treatment, but that's something that the state pays for, the city or the school district or no one, I mean, that's separate from this piece of the program. I can look at and get you the numbers for the prevention groups that we do and give you that recidivism if they stay within that prevention realm. Okay. Does, uh, thank you both. Questions from, I'm gonna ask Chief Burns to come up, I just wanna make sure we've covered questions from the committee for Mr. Nold and Mrs. Jensen. I have one for Darcy and I, yes. that was my intent to bring up Chief Burns as well, but my question for Darcy is with the Canton 
Um, you said that you do work in Canton. Mm -hmm. um, is there any funding by the school district or by the city of Canton? How does your funding go for your the work The Canton done? School District funds a portion, and then the other portion is funded through the state. The same state dollars. City. But not the city. Okay. The thank same you. state dollars. Okay. Yes. I just was curious how that works, so thank you. Great. Thank Madam you. Chair, yes. before you go Mr. to Chief Burns, may I ask one yes, more question absolutely. for Jamie, Councilor if Strong. I don't go mind? Mm -hmm. um, Jamie. Is this the best way for the school district to handle this with our contract being between the city and the school district and then you administering the funds? Would, I'm thinking I know the answer to this before I even get there. Would you prefer the contract to be between us and Prairie View, but it's somehow, some way you have, the district has to be involved in this process too because they're using your facilities and, and access to, I, <laughs> I would think that you'd want to be able to put some stipulations into in, in the access and how we work this out. But again, I guess that's another one of my is there a better way questions. Yeah. And we would definitely, because if the question was going to be raised, is this just a, a agreement between Prairie View and, and uh, the city of Sioux Falls, um, we would definitely need to be a, a player in what the language of that stated just because of the fact of the privacy and the situation that the students are in when they're under our care. Obviously, when we refer them and families, they can go there. We don't keep uh, the numbers as far as the recidivism or, or things like that on that because they're referred there and it's for them to go and get help. There's some that the school will refer. Uh, how that percent lays out, I could not answer that entirely for you. But if it was done an agreement between the two, we definitely need to be a come alongside in the language of that just because of the fact of some of the things that will impact with the students and, and the laws with the FERPA and the information that go along with that uh, to make sure that those services will meet the needs of the kids um, and how we would refer the students to those. Now there's several agencies that we refer students to on a daily basis uh, that we don't have necessarily that direct contact with other than you know what the form is that the parents have to sign off and agree to when it's referred to that so can a system be set up yeah it can be um, we've not had that so I can't answer to how that would look necessarily uh, it can be we would just like to be in agreement on that much like we do with any of the other agencies that we refer things to of what would happen what's the agreement of, of them being able to contact the students at our, our school um, we have that agreement right now with uh, many other Southeast Behavioral, uh, Vera, when they're doing different things, not necessarily, not chemical dependency, but other areas of counseling that we have those agreements with so they can do that and we don't pay those fees, but there's an agreement worked out, so we'd want to be part of that. Absolutely. One, one more, just really quick, I promise. Um, have you ever looked at, has the district ever looked at all of these programs and said, really we are investing in this these programs, whether it's in kind uh, providing service or you know space for the the families to meet in the counseling or um, the secretarial services or the time that your staff contacts families yeah. to to coordinate, yeah. to me it appears that the district does do a significant investment in this and other preventative type programs all the way from here. I used the hearing example earlier, but the nurse practitioners, like you said, with uh, you know, is federal money that's paid for it and coordinating it, and there's got to be considerable staff time through the office. So, have I doubt there's a number that you've ever sat down and figured out, but at the same time, there's not a, a numeric amount that we have come with. Uh, with each of these agreements, we have different groups, and especially the ones that come in and utilize space at the building. We try to work that out with the academic time, but there's definitely uh, services that we provide through our clerical staff that help to coordinate some of those things and work with. Some that are provided through our um, success coordinators is probably one of the most significant, and that's a, a newer position that we had hired throughout buildings, uh, the same way with the addition of the additional counselor that is assisted in that. So directly to put a dollar amount on it, I would not be able to do that at this time, but we have had staff that work with because we know it's in the best interest of the kids and whether that be with the chemical dependency which is Prairie View uh, with the mental health with a uh, bear or Southeast behavioral our staff all work in conjunction with and put time in because they know it's in the best interest of the kids of our community good thank you I hope you uh, come back and work with us some more on other issues and uh, we continue this partnership so yeah thank you both so much um, I appreciate you being collaborative and allowing us to just kind of fire some questions out as we kind of lay this foundation I'll ask you to just hang tight. Just, uh, Mrs. Jensen, do you need to? I will to get the recidivism for you. And then 
also just on the referrals step up to the mic ma'am on the referrals we do have a four part so the school district gets a copy as soon as they make a referral to us and then we track it back so whoever our referral source is gets notified and we're in that way one of the on, the only agency that does that continued follow up great thank you Chief Burns, thanks for being here and for uh, jumping in and helping us now color this with kind of the city paintbrush. Can you kind of give us some input on where we've been with the, the numbers? And uh, then I know that Councilor Erickson probably has a couple questions for you. Maybe the others do as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Councilors. Uh, Matt Burns, Police Chief. I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this today. I think this is a very responsible and proper outgrowth of the the way the conversation started. As you know, when we brought this to the budget process, one of our questions was primarily, um, is it appropriate for the city to be the primary funding source uh, for this program? We have no qualms with the program, the way it's run, uh, things like that. It was just basically a funding uh, question. Um, one of the things that came up from our perspective as we looked at this and tried to get background information was, uh, is there a way to find out uh, from the from the families from the children that had an issue that that sought the counseling um, Was there a way to get get that information and then see if they had a subsequent? Uh, subsequent offense be that possession of alcohol by a minor uh, possession of marijuana controlled substance something to, to for us to be able to look at this data and gauge if uh, if if the if the counseling had an impact um, not that that's a direct comparison, but it would inform us at a certain level if that was true. Uh, we, we engaged the school district on that, and through the, the FERPA and the HIPAA and the things like this, they, they uh, stated that we could not get that information. Um, I know, or I believe, and Ms. Jensen can correct me if I'm wrong, that when a family signs a contract to enter in this counseling, I wonder if there's not a way, and, and, and I'd like to enter this into the conversation, for them to say, to, you know, we will, we will allow the school district to share the fact that this student entered a contract with their family uh, with the police department um, so we can look back and see if we, you know, if there is a subsequent event. Um, I think that's reasonable. I'd appreciate that being part of the discussion because if we're talking about uh, having some accountability for our funding, I think that's a responsible way to look at that when we're talking about uh, the use, proper use of taxpayer funds. Right, good. Thank you. Questions from the committee for Chief Burns? I just saw him sitting in the audience and thought that since this falls within his department that yes. we should certainly yeah. hear from him as far as what he has to say. So thank you for being here and sticking it out for later into the evening anyways. So. Um, my questions are answered just with that information sharing that was kind of the avenue that I was going down that same line as far as how can this information help the police department going forward more as well and um, I know there's been a lot of changes with the juvenile justice system right and there's more to come and there's a lot of talk of different programs statewide from the um, project stand up um, I know you were emailed uh, as well from uh, Brian Zeeb, who's with um, the DCI, and it's a statewide project that they're working on as well. And so I don't want to reinvent the wheel. And if they are doing things that we can partner with them mm -hmm. and use some of their resources to then push along and, and whatever it is at a statewide level, um, I think that's definitely an avenue that we should go as well. And you have a relationship with him as well. And um, so that's an area that I think that we need to kind of be mindful of as we talk more about this to see what is the best for our community because really we all benefit from it the taxpayer benefits from it the schools benefit from it the police department hopefully benefits from it as well and to have that access to the students and so um, we've just got to find the best way to do it and there's nothing wrong at looking back and and making adjustments and changes along the way to making it work as efficient and as effective as possible right so good thank, thank you, thank you for being here Councilor Rolfing. I wasn't asleep, I promise you. But <laughs> I must not have caught how you you want information given back to you from Prairie, uh, Prairie View or other way around uh, or both ways. Uh, explain that just a little bit simpler, if you would. Right. Well, from either the school district or Prairie View Prevention as a piece of when the contract is signed and that counseling is offered to a student, uh, it would be informative and helpful to us to see if then um, 
subsequent to that, that counseling if, if there was a, a subsequent violation, and not just in a block of we had this amount of recidivism from a group, but more specific uh, to, those, to those students who actually received this, and then we could uh, look at our, at our uh, information and see was there a subsequent violation, was there another minor in possession, was there a possession of marijuana charge, was there a uh, controlled substance charge, something to give us an indi indicator, at least in some small way, that the counseling you know, uh, was effective, and, and maybe if it wasn't, then, then, then why not? You know, it, but it gives us additional data, and when we're talking about the responsible use of taxpayer funds, I think that's reasonable. Can you provide information to them that says, these people have been, uh, have been apprehended, would have picked up, whatever you want to call it, and are either going through the, the, the slap on the wrist uh, kind of thing, and you're going to be good after this, or they've been put in jail? Uh, can you share that information with, with them? Well, when it comes to students in the school district, we, we don't know the ones, and, and I guess the broader point is, we don't know the ones that actually entered into a contract and took the counseling. And so we're trying to see from that group that took the counseling, then with our subsequent violations. I'm, I'm going the other way, okay. Chief. I'll track, I'll try to track. Somebody else, somebody up on the street for whatever, um, marijuana, alcohol, whatever, yeah. a minor that is, is in high school, can you, do you share or can you share that information with the school system yeah, who can share do. it with Prairie, Prairie View yep. so that they can get an idea of who's been, what's happened here and maybe go uh, a little more aggressively after them for counseling. Yeah. Well, uh, in fact, that's how the process starts because but for that report from us to the school district, the school district might not know whom had a violation. And so then, then as part of the accountability piece, and Jamie Caprass can speak to this, uh, then they take that up with that student and say, say, you know, you need to uh, either enter into a contract or there will be certain consequences, uh, uh, you know, academically or with the school, especially if they're an athlete or something like this. So even if that happened three months in a row, someone was picked up, they would get the name three times. If it's a juvenile that receives a cite from the, or, or a citation or arrest from the police department, the school district gets that information. So then, Darcy, you can get recidivist, recidivism, that big word, um, information from that kind of that kind of information provided you by the by the police we we can get the name but the student and family have the ability to decline services and choose not to participate understand but that would be another category decline services Once, and then after that decline 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 you know on uh, no hope or whatever and then others that say Yes, we've had uh, this person was in was caught doing something this month, and we had that, and we've never heard from them again. Hallelujah! That's exactly what we want. We'd have to have, I think, several categories, but it would be something we could do because there's the declined services. They could choose to, they move someplace else, and so we we lose them. Lose they contact. Lose contact. We would have then those who did come through services. But with a, the Sioux Falls Schools policy currently, the first violation does not require that they, they do anything but the screening. So they would not, we may recommend this child needs to be in a group, but they don't have to do that. That's a parent choice at that point. So our recommendation may say that, and we would feel strongly that that would be the best for them to do that but there's not a consequence within the school system that says they have to on that first violation. May I take that one step further? Absolutely. It would seem to me then that what you've got is a perfect situation to say to parents or to these young people that says, we have statistics that say, if you come to this, this is not gonna happen again. If you decline it, you're probably going to be back two or three or four times, and therefore we're going to we we really want to stress to you that you should be in this counseling uh, program. You're hired. <laughs> Our <con> <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> the statistics that as a parent, I would look at that and say, "You got him. He's yours, mm -hmm. and I will make sure he's there." We do make, and I appreciate your support in saying that we do say those words to them and we do strongly encourage and we tell them 
if you go to teen court, you're going to be back. Why don't you just get a, come now, come through it now, and you know, then we'll take care of it right away. It doesn't have to be something that follows you into football season or wrestling or volleyball or whatever. We do that at this point. There are still some parents, though, that do decline to do services, some who choose to sit out the full 15 days. And, and or, don't. yeah. So I'm not saying we can't do it, but do understand there's going to be multiple categories to track them. I think it would be valuable, I, just from a personal standpoint, I think it would be valuable for, as a parent if this ever happened to be able to show that to a parent. Um, any responsible parent would be, would be willing to let you take over at that point and support you 100%. And some of the tracking right now that you're talking about, I can actually, we can't give school specific, but I can give as a district. For all, what overall we have. district kind of stuff. Because we yep. do track that right now. Every student that we're given a name of, we staff goes and checks and asks and says, we'll set you up for a screening. And then it's either decline or I'm, I'm going to sit out or whatever. But we could give you those stats right now. Yeah, that would be good. Good. Thank you. Madam Chief Chair. Burns, any other comments from you? No, I, don't. I don't have any. Just thank you again for the conversation. These can be tough, but it is a critical conversation that needs to occur. Well, we're, as I said earlier, we're just getting started with this conversation, so we'll be relying on you extensively, I imagine. Councilor Starr, did you have one? I was going to say a long rambling question like I usually do, but I'll try to make it quick if thank you don't you, mind, Madam the, Chair. The hour does grow late. Absolutely. Uh, um, <laughs> one of the, it, because we are in this brainstorming process, and I think Councilor Erickson brought it up earlier, from your point of view, does the administration of this program or something similar match best with your department or do, I, I think what we're all looking for is that federal dollars that could replace the city dollars in this program and we could move on and we'd all be really happy about that. But uh, those programs aren't necessarily there. Would the health department be a better place to administer this program just in, in general? Yeah, I, I will have to have that conversation with Director Frank, and I, I, I certainly, I don't know. I mean, when you talk about prevention, certain health comes to mind, but um, without her input in that process, it'd be a bit premature for me to talk about that. But really what you need, regardless of where it's from, you just need somebody who's an advocate for it and who's willing to seek the, the reforms if change is necessary. And if it stays with us, I'll do that. Perfect, right. thank you. Good, thank you, Chief Burns. And realistically, whether it comes out of the health department or the police department, it's still the same taxpayer pocket, so, you know. But I, what it, my point was is that I was thinking that there, the, does the health department and the prevention dollars have the opportunity to find grant money to replace taxpayer dollars? Would it be easier for, is that something that, that a Mary Michaels works with on a regular basis versus what uh, Chief Burns is doing with crime prevention and, and right. enforcement? So exactly. I guess. Yep. My well long taken. rambling question got to that. So. Point well taken, Councilor Starr. And good questions all the way around. So now we have done a committee thing where we're just kind of brainstorming and throwing things out. Where would the committee like to go from here? Do we do another session where we start to dig into some of the things that Councilor Erickson was talking about in terms of other dollars being available? Or do we sit down, do we have kind of a, an ad hoc group who starts to craft kind of a, a contract that involves all three of these agencies. Where would you like to go? I am open to suggestions. Madam Chair? Yes, Councilor Stark. I, I feel like I need a scorecard or some type of flow chart of kind of where each thing is going because we're doing multiple things right. here. I'll ask um, um, Mr. Bixler to take care of that for us. He will um, start to analyze this for us. So and, and then I think the next logical step is maybe a, a more of an informal process um, with people who are interested to kind of ad hoc group to to kind of to work our way through that. And I think that would be the next logical step. Okay. Other comments, thoughts? I would agree with that. I think uh, two or three of us getting together with and uh, and maybe working working through some things could uh, then bring some ideas back to this this committee for either approval or send the committee back. And I think on the ad hoc committee would be some of the people we're talking to right, right here. Exactly. Right. Councilor Erickson. I would agree with that. And at the same point, I certainly want to make sure that Chief Burns, um, as well as Darcy and um, Jamie Nold or someone from the school district is involved. Um, when the time is right, I don't know if we start first and then, and then move on. But I think it's also important to be gauging um, those that um, maybe our juvenile probation officers that are dealing with repeat offenders or dealing with people that are reporting to those 
people, the, the probation officer, if, if I'm a youth student that offended and I'm assigned to a uh, probation officer, there is a partnership amongst the schools, the youth probation officer as well as Prairie View Prevention, that even gauging some of what they are seeing and what would be helpful for their job as well, this is really a community regional partnership with all entities that um, I, I don't know, just listening to, to them um, share what their need may be, not that we're going to fill that need, mm -hmm. but they might say, hey, when I have, um, you know, student violate and report to me, this is, this is what would be even better. Let's make the process as best as we can so everyone wins by the end. So I don't know what that looks like. So chew on it for a bit and see. Councilor Ralston. I just, this, this, this coordination and collaboration comes into mind right now too. And perhaps we should also include um, the six or, or five other school districts that are in the Sioux Falls city limits mm -hmm. to be part of this. And maybe this whole thing expands uh, where uh, it's, a, it's a regional uh, type thing uh, uh, rather than just a Sioux Falls thing program wow okay that's that's it is it's big it's a yeah. big topic and um, I'm glad that we're taking the step to what so was the would we biggest like thing that we when we met with Rapid City what was the biggest thing that they um, were having trouble with meth mm. and I'm sure you're seeing it and um, that's one of the main things that they're that they're worried about and that they're having to deal with and you you've indicated that too, uh, chief and uh, and so it's it's one of those things that's coming and we need to we need to work on it okay the thing that crossed my mind as we were going through this conversation was maybe this committee needs to just go into working sessions for a couple of months and just instead of just two or three of us maybe this committee just and instead of these formal meetings we just start doing working sessions maybe in December January maybe into February just mulling through these things at the same time period but in a working situation this becomes kind of cumbersome as you've all have seen in this particular situation so that we can be a little more informal in our conversations. I'm seeing nodding heads. Are we okay with that? Yes. Councillor Starr, are you okay with that? And um, so I think that's what we'll do is in December, we'll kind of, I'll work with um, budget analyst Bixler and we'll talk about what what's the agenda items. Um, you'll also get that uh, form together, sort of the scorecard that Councilor Starr is looking for, I think that will be helpful as well. But we'll start putting a, an agenda together, look for um, input from all of you members of the committee and then from uh, you folks that have been so gracious to be here with us this evening. We'll just kind of keep going forward in terms of, we know there's a solution here, we know that there's support for this program, we understand that our children need it and that this um, city council is committed to it. So we just gotta figure out how, the, how to do it the best way possible. So again, I appreciate all of you being here. If there's nothing else for the committee, I am going to adjourn us at 6.30. Thank you all. <laughs>